time to mix things up. Don't worry, I'm still talking MLS on this channel. But for now, I want to go back and look at a league that had all the flash, but in the end, didn't have a chance. This is Rest in Peace and ASL. The 1966 World Cup. You know, the one where the trophy was stolen and then recovered by a dog named Pickles. Produced some impressive TV numbers from across the board, but especially from the American audience. Surprising, considering the US didn't even qualify in 1966. Actually, really surprising, considering the US hadn't qualified for a World Cup since 1950. The USA were not a soccer country. Yet? Okay, let's be honest. By population numbers alone, there was potential for a big audience. Plus the idea of living in America, the land of opportunity, that had to be appealing to international players. It was time to try again and start up another professional soccer league in this country. Well, actually, how about two leagues? The FIFA-sanctioned United Soccer Association, or USA, which... <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but... Did they not realize that the acronym USA was already taken, or... And the non-FIFA-sanctioned National Professional Soccer League, or the NPSL. Not to be confused with the current day NPSO, which is an entirely different league on its own. Both leagues kicked off in 1967, and both leagues flopped hard. The USA had an average attendance of under 8,000 a game. Interesting to note, however, was the championship game between the Los Angeles Wolves and the Washington Whips, which was the first ever sudden death golden goal game for FIFA. And the winner came from an own goal from the Whips. Ouch. Meanwhile, the NPSL had actually secured TV rights to CBS, but the TV numbers were abysmal. And they ran commercials during the game, not just at halftime. And it wasn't like split screen technology where you can still watch the game. No, they would actually take TV timeouts, similar to how the NFL and NBA do it. From what I've read, it seems as though the consensus was that USA had better soccer than the NPSL, which makes you wonder how it was the NPSL to secure TV rights and not the USA. Nevertheless, it's kind of easy to figure out why neither the USA or NPSL worked out. The fact that both leagues kicked off in 1967 and that many of the cities had teams in both leagues, I just feel like the USA and NPSL sort of canceled each other out. But instead of both rival leagues just giving up and folding, they actually decided to come together and merge. And thus, in December of 1967, the North American Soccer League, the NASL, was born. 17 teams, 32 games, and a weird-as-hell point system. Adopted from the NPSL. No, we're not looking at three points for a win, one point for a tie. Instead, it was six points for a win, three for a tie, zero for a loss, and one point for each goal you score up to three goals. So do the math. A win with three goals gives you nine points in the standings. So yeah, would have been wise to invest a little extra in strikers. A lot of teams were screwed over because of this format, such as the 1968 Oakland Clippers who tied for the most wins in the league, scored the most goals, and had the best goal differential. And yet, they missed the playoffs by one point. I don't know about you, but something about that seems a little broken to me. Turns out that wasn't the only rule that made the NASL different. In an effort to appeal to the American audience, they also featured a countdown clock. Because, you know, us North Americans are too stupid to understand how a clock could count upwards. And they introduced a hockey-style penalty shootout in 1974. Because, you know, us North Americans are too stupid to understand what a tie is. Now, if you remember, MLS had these same quirks in the early days. The difference between MLS and the NASL is that, well, 
MLS was able to realize soon after how silly these changes were, and the NASL never adjusted. I should note that a lot of people actually really did like this penalty shootout. Johan Cruyff even went so far as to say that they should try it out in Europe. Perhaps the biggest rule change the NASL implemented was the use of a 35-yard line that would run across the field. The best way to describe this is think about the blue line in hockey. Normal soccer games, you could be offsides at any point in the offensive side of the field. With the NASL field, you could only be offsides within the 35-yard line. In theory, this was supposed to prevent offside traps and aid the offense by giving them more room to create. You know, I think this was just a case of an idea sounding okay, or at the very least, interesting on paper. But then when you see it play out, you realize in the end that it's just kind of unnecessary. I watched some old NASL games, and it just kind of looked awkward. And I'm not even sure it really helped out the offense in the end. However, I will say the 35-yard line, it was a nice visual for where players were supposed to start during the penalty kick shootout, so at least it had that going for it. Okay, 1968, the first NASL season. Among the 17 teams that participated, there was a total of 30 North American players. That's less than two North Americans per roster. This was kind of a problem, because if the U.S. wanted to qualify for the 1970 World Cup, it was clear that they weren't going to get any of its talent from its own domestic league. And remember, at this point, Americans weren't even dreaming of playing in Europe yet. You know, by the way, no, the U.S. didn't qualify. Again. You see, no one in the league really knew what they were doing. No one knew what it took to make soccer succeed in this country. You look at today and say, yeah, you know, you need a good foundation, a youth academy, an owner that cares, a good stadium, and a strong location, solid marketing. But there was none of that in 1968, because no one knew how to do that. And as a result, you had some interesting strategies employed by teams trying to prepare for the upcoming season. The most insane being the Dallas Tornado, who went on a 45-match preseason world tour where they played in five continents, including games in Vietnam. Like, oh, oh, God. They played more matches in the preseason world tour than they did in the regular season. And did it pay off? I don't know. Does winning two games in the NASL season count as paying off? The Atlanta Chiefs, coached by longtime EPL striker Phil Woosnam, won the first NASL championship over the San Diego Toros by the aggregate score of 3-0. After that one year of coaching in the NASL, the next year, in 1969, Woosnam became the commissioner of the NASL while also coaching the U.S. men's national team. How he did both, I really have no idea. Year two of the NASL, 1969, was a complete and utter disaster. 12 of the 17 teams apparently had enough and elected to fold before the season began. Boom, 70% of the teams gone, just like that. CBS saw this and was like, oh, f*** that, and they bounced too, leaving the league without a TV partner. As a result, average attendance dropped below 3,000. Yay! I don't really understand how the league didn't go under after this season, but somehow, some way, they made it into the 70s. And slowly but surely, soccer started to catch on in this country. To be honest, I don't know if the NASL had much to do with it yet. But nonetheless, the number of high schools that offered varsity soccer was 800 in 1965. And by 1970, that number was 2,800. And while the crowds may have sucked for the NASL, they definitely didn't suck for the international friendlies. 22,000 showed up to see Pelé's Santos taking on West Ham. New York loved Pelé whenever he visited, and Pelé loved New York. Hmm, who knows, might just be foreshadowing something here. In 1970, the league expanded to six teams, adding Washington and Rochester, while Baltimore folded. And this is kind of how the rest of the decade went. Teams coming, teams going, teams moving pretty much every year. This wasn't like MLS, where you would get one or two expansion teams a year. 
No, NASL would get up to eight expansion teams a year while having two other teams fold. Yeah, 1974. That was a pretty wild year. The NASL went from six teams in 1970 to 24 teams in 1978, which... 24 teams. That was actually more teams than either the NHL or the NBA had. Hmm. That's a lot of teams that were added really fast. Ah, well, probably nothing to worry about. Now, part of the reason the league began to explode in teams was because they actually got their games back on TV. The 1974 NASL final between the LA Aztecs and the Miami Toros was the first national broadcast of a soccer game in the U.S. since the first NASL season back in 1968. Attendances across the board continued to rise, and now there were teams averaging over 10,000 a game. And the NASL actually started to produce some entertaining soccer. And they were competitive with some of the international teams that came over for friendlies. It was turning into a real league. There were a lot of teams that made their mark in the NASL. Teams like the Rowdies, Sounders, Earthquakes, Kicks, Whitecaps, Timbers. These teams really produce great attendance numbers. Like, even if you were to go by today's MLS standards, they had great numbers. And if you just looked at these teams, you might actually believe the NASL had stronger support than MLS. The problem was that the league was horribly imbalanced. In the same year you had the Seattle Sounders average 23,828, you had the Boston Minutemen average 2,571. In the same year you had the Cosmos average 47,856, you had the Chicago Sting average just 4,188. Hey, speaking of the Cosmos, yep, it's time to talk about them. Remember when I was listing off all the teams that left their mark in the NASL? Truth be told, they were all tiny compared to the one team that everyone wanted to be, the New York Cosmos. They arrived in 1971, won their first championship soon after in 1972. But when they truly became giants in the world of soccer is when they signed the then undisputed best player to ever play the game, Pelé three-time World Cup champion, and over 600 goals in his time with Santos. It was unfathomable to think that he was coming over to America. But like I said before, Pelé loved New York, and he felt like he was doing his part in helping advance the game, saying, My contract is not just to play for the Cosmos. It is also to promote soccer in America. Now, because the deal to bring Pelé to New York cost $7 million, that... <laughs> completely destroyed the NASL salary cap. Well, let's be real. None of the owners really cared about that. Because the thought of making a ton of money with full stadiums to watch play, trust me, that was way more important than trying to keep the competition fair. His first game with the Cosmos, an exhibition against the Dallas Tornado, had over 5 million people watching on TV. Side note. Apparently they could afford Pelé, but they couldn't afford a proper field to play on. I mean, seriously, look at the condition of this. The field was so bad that they actually spray painted certain areas green to make it look better on TV. Oh, and also, no one watching on TV actually witnessed Pelé's goal that game because the game cut away to commercial and missed the goal. God. CBS, maybe it's a good thing you don't cover that much soccer anymore. Pelé lasted three years with the Cosmos and helped them to a second soccer bowl in 1977. Much like David Beckham in MLS, Pelé may have been the first mega superstar, but he wasn't the last. Without Beckham, there's, most likely, no Henri, no Rooney, no Zlatan. And without Pelé, there's most likely no George Best, no Johan Cruyff, and no Franz Beckenbauer. And the NASL still didn't produce any American stars. During the NASL's entire existence, the U.S. men's national team never qualified for the World Cup. So while us North Americans may drool over the thought of a player well past his prime finishing his career in the United States, come on, Ronaldo, ultimately, that will never be enough to keep our interest. 
Now while the Cosmos were sitting pretty, averaging over 40,000 in attendance from 1978 to 1980, the rest of the league was losing money. Well, okay, the rest of the league was hemorrhaging money. That's probably a better way to describe it. Every team was losing millions of dollars. And remember, this is millions of dollars in 1970s money. The players wanted more money from a league that uh, didn't have it. This compiled with the league just completely refusing to even acknowledge any of the NASLPA's labor disputes, and eventually the players went on strike in 1979. Which was a complete disaster. Now not every player went on strike, so the NASL elected to keep playing. And what you had were some teams fielding full strength, and some teams fielding replacement players, such as the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, who had their own head coach, Ron Newman, come out of retirement for their game. The strike lasted five days, or one game in the schedule for everyone, before the NASLPA backed down. Huge loss. This set the precedent that the owners were in complete power and that the players were never really going to get what they wanted. Three teams folded following the 1980 season, bringing the number of teams down to 21. And then after 1981, another seven teams folded, bringing the total number of teams down to 14. After 1981, Commissioner Phil Woosnam was voted out by the owners of the league, survivor style. And the league, once again, went off air, as there weren't any network TV partners anymore. And then the league went down to 12 teams after 1982, and then down to just nine teams after the 1983 season. And then 1984, the last hurrah. Nine teams, no TV deals, the average attendance was now back down to under 11,000. Even the New York Cosmos had lost all of its flair. And in February 1985, they announced they were leaving the league. And one month later, the NASL announced it was suspending operations. It was all over. At the end of the 70s, people were predicting soccer to be the sport of the future in America. Yeah, didn't exactly turn out as expected, did it? So what killed the NASL? Well, a couple things, actually. First of all, it was lack of vision. And with that, overexpansion. Many of the owners who bought in were expecting a quick buck. And when that didn't happen, owners jumped ship. They didn't believe in the product. Second was a lack of infrastructure. There wasn't any youth academies, therefore you couldn't develop any domestic talent. And when you continuously miss out on the World Cup for decades, people will eventually lose interest. There were no soccer-specific stadiums, therefore teams had to pay rent to play in these stadiums. Now, usually they would pay rent to the NFL, who saw the NASL as competition, so you know they weren't doing them any favors. And they could never secure a long-time TV deal. Pretty self-explanatory. If your sport isn't on TV, you're going to lose fans. And third, the New York Cosmos. Yes, they were the flagship franchise of the NASL. They made the league bigger than it has ever been before. But once the NASL allowed the salary cap to be destroyed, they bought all the best players and no one could catch up. Many of the teams didn't even try to catch up. They knew they couldn't. But now the good news. The mistakes of the NASL ultimately helped MLS become what it is today. Look, while I would like to believe that MLS can someday move past the single entity model, I do have to acknowledge that without it, MLS would not have lasted 25 seasons. Like. No, not a chance. There's a reason why all of the expansion teams that MLS has brought in are still around, why none of them have folded. Except for Chivas USA, but like, that was a really weird situation. Now, as far as the second iteration of the NASL, that's for another time. For now though, let me know what you guys thought about the NASL. Were you around for it? How did it compare to MLS? And was there anything that the NASL actually did better than MLS? Let me know. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.